Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. I'm Henry Smith. Today we begin a two-part series on a new book that's been recently published called Scribes and Scripture. Our guest is a co-author, John Mead. He has a PhD and is the director of the Text and Canon Institute at Phoenix Seminary, where he also serves as a professor of Old Testament. And Dr. Mead has been on the program before to talk about the text of the Bible. Well, John, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Uh, it's great to, it's just great to have you back on the show. Thanks again for having me, Henry. It's All always right. a pleasure. All right, so we're gonna have a two, we're gonna have uh, two episodes and it feels like it's hardly enough to unpack this great book that you have co-authored with your colleague, uh, Peter Gurry, Dr. Peter Gurry, Scribes and Scripture, uh, available at crossway.org. Okay, we're gonna get started uh, on this book. Uh, we're gonna kind of jump in. You, be you guys begin the book of this story I've never heard before about this woman named uh, Mary Jones and how we sort of take what we think about having access to the Bible today compared to just a couple centuries ago. Yeah, that's right. So Mary's uh, just a, a wonderful figure. Of course, not much is said about her, known about her. I don't think she uh, lived a life, you know, that was, uh, that she would have thought worthy to be mentioned in, a, in books. You know what I mean? Uh, Mary just was kind of ordinary. But uh, in the 1800s, She's a she's a Welsh gal and uh, has this burning desire to to have like a, a copy of the Bible uh, in her own language, in her own in her own hands. Um, you know, we, we tell a little story about how she would walk, you know, long distances to try to to try to actually have the Bible in her hand. These sorts of things. We stumbled upon her story um, because the United Bible Society or the British uh, Bible Society um, actually uses her as an exa as the kind of the historical uh, inspiration for what they went on to do, and that was to try to produce uh, Bibles and translations uh, for for you know for for the British colonies. You know, uh, the, the 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 foreign Bible society uh, existed to do this. So so Mary was kind of the ordinary gal, really, that just wanted to have the Bible in her hands, just wanted to treasure the Word of God, be able to read it every day. In the book, we actually, uh, there, we had, there's a picture of um, uh, the table of, con or I think it's one of the table of contents in her yes. Bible uh, with a note uh, of, how, of how she got it, you know, and, and, and uh, the dates on it and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, Mary's, um, Mary kind of shames me in a lot of ways, Henry, because I have, numerous Bibles in on my bookshelf here, you know, yes. <laughs> and, and, yes. uh, and, and I, and I feel like I, I treasure it less than she does or did. Does that make sense? So yes. wonderful story, super inspiring. Um, but it really got us thinking about how we got the Bible. How can we continue to tell the story of how we got the Bible so that the Marys of the church and the kingdom of God uh, can be inspired to read it more and to have a greater understanding of how we got it. Yeah, it really moved my heart. Uh, I thought it was a great opening. You know, I I felt the same way. I felt a, a minor, maybe small rebuke from the Lord of don't take for granted the time that you live in and the blessing that you have to have access to the Bible in so many, so many ways. How many miles Amen. would you, how many miles would you walk to have a copy of the Bible when you didn't have one? And, and that there's people groups in the world that don't have a complete Bible today. You know, that's, yes. that's another thing about it. Well, anyway. Stobering. Please, folks, get, get a copy of the book and read more about that story. Okay, so you, you guys do divide the book into sort of three main sections, text, canon, and translation. Talk about, talk about that layout a little bit. Yeah, uh, very good. So, um, well, by now, your, your, your audience knows that the Bible doesn't fall out of heaven on a sheet, uh, <laughs> bound between two faux leather covers, and in the English language, okay, for example, uh, the Bible uh, comes to us after a long, arduous history. And this is the story we're trying to tell through those three main blocks, the text of the Bible, that part one there focuses on what do we know about ancient writing? What do we know about how ancient Israelite scribes worked and operated? 
What do we know about ancient literacy in Israel, for example? Or, or what do we know about uh, scribes or, or others learning how to write, you know, maybe learning how to read even? So, so in chapter one of that first part on text, we actually take a deeper dive into the ancient world and look at this whole world of scribes. And, and these unsung heroes, they're anonymous, right? Hardly, hardly any names are assigned to them. Uh, there are a few, but hardly any. And they tell us so much about, uh, or they've left behind so much uh, for us to study and research. So chapter one deals with kind of just this whole topic of ancient writing. Then uh, once texts are written, they then become copied and copied and copied and copied. And so we trace that story for the Old Testament in chapter two and for the New Testament in chapter three. And then, uh, then right, texts probably weren't immediately thought of as canonical, okay? There was, there was another process. Once we had books, once we had copies of books, once those books um, really became recognized as containing God's voice, so to speak, uh, then we can start talking about how they're authoritative for the Israelite community and then the, later on the church, right? And, uh, and so um, can, canon history is the substance of part two. And I, maybe we'll get to this. I don't know. I'll just drop this spice. I mean, the, we go all the way up to the Reformation with yeah. this topic. And uh, really parsing out how the pro how Protestants got their Old Testament, how Roman Catholics right have their Old Testament right as the result of the Council of Trent and so on and so forth. Um, so, and then we have a chapter on the New Testament canon as well. We can talk more about that. But then once once we've got like a, a text history laid out, a canonical history laid out, right, the specific books that belong in our Bible, we we have to deal with the fact that most people don't read the Bible in Hebrew or in Greek or, or the little parts in Aramaic. Most people access the Bible through translation. So part three uh, is, is titled translation. Chapter seven deals with ancient translation. So there's a whole fascinating history, Henry, about how the Bible was translated into Greek and Latin and, and other le lesser known languages like Coptic and yes. so on. So, so we've got uh, a, a whole chapter devoted to that that goes all the way up to John Wycliffe, who is right translating Latin manuscripts in the 1200s into Old English or Middle English, yes. right? So we've yes. got the start then of an English Bible translation history there going on in the uh, in the in the 13th, 14th centuries, and then finally chapters eight and nine really try to detail the English Bible uh, history as well as what do we do with all the modern translations today? Yeah. Right. This this is a question that Dr. Gurry and I get. Uh, anytime we're speaking in churches, what translation's the best one? You know, yeah. and uh, basically we answer that as whatever one you're reading. That's Ex the best. Excellent. One. <laughs> that's an excellent survey. We're just getting started now, John. We got to go to that's a break. Right. We got to go to a break, and we're going to get right back to it after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Today our guest is Dr. John Mead, and we're here talking about his new book co-authored with his colleague Peter Gurry, Scribes and Scripture, and we encourage you to pick that up at crossway.org. Okay, uh, John, you kind of laid out this, the broad scope of the book, which I think was really important, but here I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just going to give you a, a quote from Augustine that sort of is at the end of the book, and it sort of is, it builds up to that, and then I'll let you sort of comment on that. So, 
Uh, you guys quote Augustine here, and by the way, I've read this quote many times and I love it because I think it encapsulates it. So when he's in, in, interpreting scripture, he says, anything in those books which seems contrary to truth, I decide either the text is corrupt, let's talk about that, the translator did not follow what was really said, or I failed to understand it. What a, what a view of, of the broad picture of what you guys are doing in the book. Yeah. Talk, talk about that. Un, let's unpack what Augustine said there. and, and Yeah. Uh, of course, we know a lot yeah. more about all that today. Yeah, wonderful. So, so I think in that section, in the conclusion of the book, we're trying to bring a number of threads together. We have, we have laid out the humanness, the human element, so to speak, of how we got the Bible in all the preceding chapters. Make sure, if you, if you really read one chapter in this book, you must read the conclusion. Okay, that's that's the one you must read uh, because that's where this is found. So what we're getting at is a posture now. How? What's our stance towards the the Bible, the Bible's history, and more importantly, our understanding of it? Okay, so Augustine, I think, leads the way here to say, look, the problem is never with God. The problem is never with God. The problem Amen. is never with God's word or his revelation. Rather, the problem could be with sloppy scribes. Okay? Scribes make mistakes. Augustine in in the in the fourth, fifth century was very aware that not that his manuscripts did not always agree. Okay. So Augustine um uh, leaves that open as a possibility. He then, so the text is corrupt. That means a scribe maybe has made a mistake. Or he's also reading uh, the Bible in Latin translation. So he's uh, really in a situation very close to ours. Most of us read the Bible uh, not in the original languages, right? Probably most of us in this audience read the Bible in English. And so, therefore, we need to hold open the possibility that there's something about the Word of God that we don't get because it was lost in translation. Okay, that's, that's the second possibility that Augustine gives. And then here's one of the greatest minds of the entire history of the church, humbly admitting and confessing before God himself that perhaps I just failed to understand it. You see, that's, that's, that's a real posture of humility yes. uh, before God and his word. And so maybe a scribe made a mistake, maybe something was lost in translation, or maybe the problem is just with me and I can't understand it. And, uh, and, I, and I've failed to understand it. Augustine is famous for another line. I think it's in the book somewhere. We talk about faith seeking understanding. This is a posture of of believing even while we're seeking to understand the truth of who God is and how he's revealed himself to us through his word. So these are old things, I, uh, old ideas that I wish we could retrieve as Christians. And uh, anyhow, so. Yeah, that's, one, that's wonderful. You know, it does remind me too of uh, Jesus didn't talk about translation or scri uh, scribal activity per se, but he did often say to people, have you not read? The, the assumption always is from Jesus when he's teaching scripture is that if there's a problem, it's not the scripture that's the problem. You're the problem. Yeah, and, that's exactly right. And, and you know, that, that's pointed, but, but Jesus, of course, could be very pointed about certain things. And it's, it's to get us to submit our hearts to the authority of the word. It's, he, the word transforms us, we don't change it. And, and that imprint is throughout your book. And that's one of the things I love about it. We're talking about all these different technical things, and they're important, yeah. but it's this yeah. posture coming at the Word yes. of God. Now, right. let's, let's talk about distinction here, John. We've got a couple more minutes in this segment. You, you also cite C.S. Lewis. I mean, this just made me so happy. Um, you know, the Bible's inspiration was an or extraordinary new event. That means the original author, yes. uh, which fed into God's ordinary way of working into the world, and there you're inferring scribal activity. Tell us the theological distinction, because this is super important. Yeah, yeah, what we're, what we're trying to detail there is that uh, the original inspiration of human authors, so that God had written what he wanted to have written. We call this divine inspiration. It is a miracle, right? The Bible everywhere presents 
this activity as a one-off, a miracle, okay? And what Lewis is getting at is, you know, this, this is a pattern that we see from the scriptures themselves. So let's take the, ver the, uh, the uh, virgin conception, right? So there's a miraculous pregnancy that occurs in Mary's womb, right? But, but after that, as soon as that miracle happens, immediately Mary's body is subject to all the normal human processes, right? That is entailed with a nine month pregnancy, a birthing of Jesus, right? And then a raising of a baby boy, right? So what's so interesting is that we as Christians know this in so many areas, or, or I think Lewis uses the other example from John 2, how Jesus can turn water into wine. This is a, this is a total miracle. And yet, once that wine is consumed, right, it has all its usual effects upon those <laughs> present at the wedding at Cana, you yes. know? And so, <laughs> yes. and, and, and I just, I, I think this is so amazing how the miraculous kind of gives way to the ordinary. And we have no trouble seeing this in many areas. But when it comes to the Bible, Christians have had, a, had some questions about this. And so what we're trying to do there with, in terms of the Bible is say, well, there's a miracle of divine inspiration, but then that, that, that writing, that text is then kind of introduced into the ordinary processes of copying human beings, hand copying manuscripts. And, and we're still going to say God superintends providentially over, but, but definitely in a different way, right? Than yeah. he, than he um, inspired the original text. So that's, that's what we're trying to get at there. And Lewis's analogies are perfect, I think, for what we're trying to do. It is. All right. In our next segment, we're going to turn our attention to the kind of copying that scribes undertook in the ancient world. And friends, we'll be right back uh, in our last segment here in part one with Dr. John Mead. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. John Mead. We're talking about his book, co-authored with Peter Gurry, Scribes and Scripture. Okay, John, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the copying of the text. Uh, you have three categories. I'm going to let you explain the categories of copying, and we're going to flesh that out. Go ahead, please. Great. Yeah, so... Uh, from 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 the data, from the manuscripts, and this, by the way, this would maybe go from both old Old Testament manuscripts, New Testament manuscripts. This is just these are just some general phenomena. We've got um, conservative copying approaches, uh, free copying approaches, and then something we we just sort of catch all call careless copying uh, approaches. Okay, um, what what we mean by this is that. Uh, again, man, scribes are, are hand copying, right? A text in front of them, okay? There are a number of mistakes that can just happen uh, in the normal process of copying, okay? And uh, in the book, we, we talk about one from Isaiah 40, uh, verses uh, 7 and 8. You know, that one that ends with, but the, but the word of our God remains forever. You know, this famous verse here from Isaiah 40 verse 8. But within that section, we show from one of the famous Dead Sea Scrolls, known as the Great Isaiah Scroll, that the scribe actually skipped all of verse 7. This, this text that begins with, you know, the, the, uh, the grass withers and the flower fades. There's four words in Hebrew, and it's actually a repetition. It, it begins uh, verse 8, and it also uh, begins verse 7. Okay. And uh, what's interesting is that in the great Isaiah scroll, and we actually have a picture of it in the book here. 
uh, the scribe has skipped from the first instance to the second instance. And if you want to, you know, don't make fun of scribes. You try to copy something by hand and see them, the games that your eyes and mind play with you yes. and just see how many times you do that. OK, well, anyways, that's an example of careless copying. OK, there's that's no great. there's no motive there. There's nothing. It's just a mistake. And we talk about that uh, to some degree now. What do we mean? Conservative copying is probably what most of this audience has in mind when they think about a scribe sitting down and copying. So there's probably no need to go into that. But just so you know, there are real, real examples from millennia ago that just snapshot conservative, extremely conservative copying. OK, letter by letter copying. OK, and uh, and these were trained scribes, professionals. And they did really, really sound work. Where most of the audience is probably going to have a question or two is this idea of free copying. Yes. Or this I or right, or this idea that maybe a scribe could intervene and do some things uh, that that aren't necessarily reflected in the text he was copying. Okay, that's I think probably where some of us are going to have some questions. So um, anyhow, wh which way do you want to go with that, Henry? Well, let's let's uh, just take a couple of minutes uh, yeah. and let's talk about this, uh, how, you know, we see variations in the in the Ten Commandments. Maybe give a summary of that, what a scribe did with one section and you put it in another. And, yes. you know, yes. critical scholars interpret that as, see, there's all these different texts and blah, blah, blah. But you have a different yeah. you have a different interpretation. Let's let's talk about that. OK, OK. Yeah. So in, in the book, uh, we talk about a certain Dead Sea Scroll uh, called 4Q Deuteronomy N. By the way, if this this nomenclature of 4Q, <laughs> it's, it's all very technical. Uh, all we mean is that this scroll uh, primarily of Deuteronomy chapter uh, five and a little bit of six uh, was taken from the fourth cave at Qumran on the northwest side of the Dead Sea. OK, and then. It's called Deuteronomy because it's the text of Deuteronomy, but and then it's got a little N above it that separates it from all the other scrolls of Deuteronomy found in the same cave. So, so don't be turned off by that. That's just a kind of way to reference things. So 4Q Deuteronomy N is a fascinating text. It has been described as a, an excerpted text. I'll come back to that in a second. It's also been described as a harmonizing text. Uh, and scholars right now, Henry, don't really know exactly what to do with it. They just know that it's a text that's very, very different from copies of Deuteronomy that appear later. OK, so that's and, and sometimes uh, scholars might say that this is a so-called non-aligned text. That is, it's got so many unique readings in it. And it doesn't seem to align with anything we or any other uh, textual examples. So they look at it and they kind of throw their hands up and they go, well, maybe it's just produced at a place where scribes created chaos. OK, and maybe they maybe they didn't even know what they were doing. OK, like there's there's all kinds of um, hypotheses out there about this text. Now, very quickly. Um, it does show what we call excerption. So if you think about Deuteronomy 5, this is mainly where the Ten Commandments are found. But this text doesn't begin with Deuteronomy 5. It probably began with Deuteronomy 8, verses 5 through 10. Now, Deuteronomy 8 is this wonderful sermon. Moses is trying to motivate the people to obey the Lord so that, so that when they go in the land, they'll live the blessed life in the land and, and, and obey his word, walk in his ways, all these sorts of things. And so, Deuter so, so some scribe found Deuteronomy 8, verses 5 to 10, a, as a wonderful introduction, you see, to the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. Now, that sounds really weird to us. We have a certain order of chapters, verses. None of us would ever think about copying a text that way. Yes, and we wouldn't mess, we wouldn't mess with the text. And that's, exactly. how, that's how it's interpreted. So yes. Uh, it, it could be for a lot of different reasons. Now, John, uh, I, I hate to do this to you. We are going to wrap up that thought. So this will have to allow people to watch part two. Why? Yes. Why did a scribe put Deuteronomy 8 there? Well, right. 
We're going to talk about that in part one of our next episode. So, John, thanks for coming in on the show, and let's continue our conversation uh, for part two of Scribes of Scripture. Thanks for being here, John. Appreciate it. Thanks, Henry. All right. So, friends, we're going to be back for part two with Dr. John Mead. Don't miss it. We're going to be talking about the Ten Commandments, and Dr. Mead's going to resolve this puzzle that we were just discussing. Thank you for supporting the ministry of ABR and for watching Digging for Truth. Have a great day.